this world would just fade in the light of your glory and your grace. We'd fix our eyes on you, the author and finisher of our faith, God. We love you in this place, Lord. Monk. 
Before we set out, because we're going to be talking about the law and uh, empty religious things today quite a bit, this is a very misunderstood topic, and it, it's easy to understand why. Because you can, as human beings, this is one of those areas in our lives where we can really make the Bible, at least somehow in our minds, say what we want it to, one way or another. When it comes to rules and living by rules and breaking rules and just, just today, I was in an online discussion. It was about the church and uh, being part of a local church. And I got to see all kinds of opinions from, I don't need no church, follow Jesus, to, you know, you cannot be saved if you're not part of a local body. So, you know, I want to be biblical. But that's just one small example of how we have to divide between... Um, the, the, the rules and the, the instructions of God and the leading and the life of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. He will lead us into where we need to go if that is where our heart is truly pointed. How many of you believe that? He will. And so we will learn, we'll, you know, we'll grow, we may, we'll, we'll go left and right, and he will put us back on course if that is where our heart is. If our heart is pointed at pleasing Jesus, at honoring God and knowing him, he will be faithful to lead us. Amen. But we've got to know that the other side of that coin is that if our heart is pointed towards something else, we will be able to lead ourselves in the wrong direction. Hopefully God slap, gives us a slap and says, hey, wake up there, Dallas. Nope, back here. That's what we all need. Amen. Does anybody have a $100 bill? I kind of need to borrow a $100 bill today. Um, why don't you bring me your mom's purse right there? If you've got, you got one, just bring it up. I, I already looked. No, just bring me the whole thing. Aaron, just bring me the whole purse. I already looked, and there isn't one in here, but I need one. So if you've got one, just bring it up. I need to borrow it for an illustration. A purse like this should have 10 Gs in the bottom of it. There's no $100 bill. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody? Come on. Some, all right, bring it up. Bring it up. Come on. Thank you. All right. You want interest. You're gonna, are you, that's how it's going to be, huh? Well, the Lord says, I will repay. So, just kidding. So this is a $100 bill. Thank you. You'll get it right back. Uh, you know, we can do a lot of things with this $100 bill. It has real value. And to most of us, at least, it's something significant. You could go out to dinner a couple times, probably, unless you've got a huge family. Our whole family went to Guadalajara last week, and I'm sure this did not cover the bill. <laughs> but normally, it has real value. This, so this is just a great illustration of, like, God and his leadership in his life, his instruction in our life. His commands are precious. They're more precious than gold and silver because they're the words of life, because he shows us darkness from light. He shows us the path we can walk down. Amen. Well, what religion does, what living by the law instead of the Spirit does, is it tries to take this precious, beautiful thing and just make it a little bit better. And so we end up with this instead. <laughs> and so where we had just something simple that, and clear that Jesus was telling us 
Now we have something much bigger and much more beautiful. This is more impressive than this, isn't it? I mean, look at the size of it. Look at the wonderful paper it's printed on. You can see it so much more clearly. It's, it's, got a, it's a track, actually. It's got stuff written on the back from Living Waters, but it's an impressive $100 bill. But how many of you know, if I go to actually try to use these two to get something important, one of them will buy my dinner, if it's not too many people, and one of them will get a smile out of the waitress and she'll still be waiting there for my other one, right? Amen. Thank you, Pooh. Thank you. I told you I'd give this back. All right. So it's fun to, it's easy to talk about these things, but to discern how to walk this out in our life is much more complicated at times. Today we're going to dive into this. We're going to look at Paul, in particular from Acts chapter 21. I want to set the stage with some other scriptures, though. I'm just going to read right through them. All right? Start with Colossians chapter 2, verse 23. Such regulations have an appearance of wisdom. And we're going to get into this scripture, God willing, if we have time toward the end. So I'm just reading a little piece of it. But with their self imposed worship, their false humility, their harsh treatment of the body, and underline this if you would, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. These are different kinds of rules Paul's talking about that the church set up, that people set up. They lack any value. Better underline that part twice. They lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. In other words, it is not by the rules that we set up around us that our heart is changed. It is changed a different way. Then there's the way of the Spirit, John chapter 6, verse 63. The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life, which underline those. You see, those words Jesus spoke, those are commands, right? Many of them. They're instructions. So there's a difference we can see here between uh, uh, rules and pieces of the law which are set up to live by and the words of Christ. There's something, there's two things happening here. And the words of Christ bring life. Yes. Amen. They bring life. A truth, I didn't write it down there for you, but you can write it yourself if you'd like. The key to life in the Spirit is sowing to please the Spirit. Sowing to please the Spirit. Galatians chapter 6 says this, Do not be deceived, beginning in verse 7. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. But whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. And so we can see here that as we're walking through, and this is very brief, of course, our explanation, but as we're walking through our Christian life, there's something going on here. There, is, there are things we do intentionally. There's a sowing to the Spirit. What does that mean? That simply means this. We're listening to the Holy Spirit the best we can. We're doing things in our life which cultivate our life with God, our walk with God, our openness and tenderness to the leading of God through the Holy Spirit. That's what we want. Amen? This is what we do. This is the path of life. We're listening to God. We're following Him. We're going to reap eternal life. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. Last one of these scriptures. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Would you underline that? The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Lord God, as we come before you in your word here, and, and Lord, I'm not even sure I could, I'm, sh I'm sure I can't communicate this as clearly as, as you would if you were standing here. But God, as we look to your word, God, we are praying that you will open our eyes and let us discern by your leading Holy Spirit between what is dead, dead works, and what is life. Your words, Jesus, your leadership, Spirit of Christ. 
your commands, God, that are life. Thank you, Lord. God, lead us in this, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Remember that life is in the Spirit. How do you divide between these? Life giving and life taking. Let's begin with Acts chapter 21 here, verse 17, and we're going to look at an example here from Paul. How many of you have enjoyed this series on Acts? I think it's been great. Praise God. So Paul is heading toward Jerusalem, and um, he knows there's something coming. He's been warned um, it, prophetically that he may be arrested or something else may happen to him. He knows, he doesn't know the details of it, but he knows there's about to be something happening. Verse 17, when we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters received us warmly. And the next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James and all the elders who were present. And James was the head elder of the church in Jerusalem. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. So Paul was giving them his testimony. He was talking about all the people who had been saved, all the amazing things that had happened. Paul had been on his missionary journey. He'd been planting churches. He'd been out there raising up the church. Among the Gentiles, though. And when Paul, when they heard this, verse 20, they praised God. Well, what, what believer wouldn't? Then they said to Paul, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed and all of them are zealous for the law. Why don't you just underline that right here? Because we're about to get into difficult territory here as Paul tries to navigate this in the Jerusalem church. Underline that part. All of them are zealous for the law. Now, what do, what do, what do the elders mean by this? James and the leaders in the church, what are they talking about? The, when they say the law... And we need to be clear about this. They're talking about the Old Testament instructions, okay? They're talking about also the things that, the, the way those were interpreted um, that affected the way Jews lived. Because a lot of the things Jews lived, did even in that day, they, they were an attempt to obey the law, but there was more than just what God had written in Deuteronomy. There was how do we walk that out? You know, we don't want to do too much work on the Sabbath, but what does that look like? And so there are a whole bunch of more rules that have been added to try to, you know, make sure that we did the right thing on the Sabbath day. You know, this, man, I should have kept that $100 bill. It wasn't enough to say, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. We had to have this. You know, you can only walk 150 yards or whatever it was on the Sabbath day, All right? And this was their culture. This is what they've been raised in. And they had come to know Christ. They were Jews who had come to Christ. And now they're talking to Paul, who'd been living a bunch, among a bunch of heathens. Paul had been ministering to people like, you know, Irish people. <laughs> savages. Savages. Native American people. Norwegian people. German people. Crazy, crazy people. This is who Paul had been around. All of the good people, the Jewish people, were still there in Jerusalem. Of course, they were scattered around, but they had knowledge of God. Their ancestors had been, you know, Jewish people, which means they knew God. They weren't like coming out of some crazy idolatry and all this stuff. And so they had a level of sophistication when it came to understanding the intricacies of how you were going to obey God and love God through all these parts of what God had said. And that's what they were living out as Jewish Christians. All of them are zealous for the law. Now, I'm going to read some things into this. Unless I read some things, you know, when you read things into the Bible, I mean, when you're like, you know, you're trying to really interpret the words, you, sometimes you read yourself in. So I realize that. So that might happen. If you hear some of that, just ignore it. Okay? Listen to the Holy Spirit. But it says all of them are zealous for the law. First off, I doubt it's all of them. It's probably not really all of them. But this is what uh, James and the head elders of the group are saying, that everybody here is really zealous to, like, be careful to follow the law here. And they've been informed that you, Paul, 
Verse 21, you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. All right, so let's let the Bible interpret itself here. When they say zealous for the law, James or the elders there are defining that partly. Their version of zealous for the law includes circumcising your children. You all know what circumcision is, right? Look it up. You got Google. So there's nothing wrong with circumcision. The Bible's really clear. There's nothing extra holy about circumcision. It no longer has any meaning before God, like so many other parts of the old law. It's just it doesn't get you brownie points with God. So you're telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. I want you to circle that word customs. Now, you get a picture of what we're talking about when we talk about the law here. We're talking about traditions, and we're talking about customs. What shall we do? They will certainly hear that you have come, Paul. So do what we tell you. Would you underline that? Do what we tell you. Do what we tell you, Paul. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Take these men. Join in their purification rites and pay their expenses so they can have their heads shaved. Then everyone will know. And would you, would you just circle and underline that right there? Then everyone will know. Just circle, There you go. That's really important here. This is the crux. This is why this is happening here. Then everyone will know there's no truth in these reports about you, that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. I better underline that last part too. You're, you yourself are living in obedience to the law. And just so there's no confusion here, he already defined part of what he means by the law, right? You circumcise your kids if you want to be really pleasing to God. Even though we're saved through Jesus, you follow these customs, these Jewish customs. You know, you wash your hands a certain way, you do a certain thing on Sabbath day. Now, what is the shaving of the head and all that? I mean, I've seen Scorny Weaver shave her head. It wasn't that glorious. Why are they shaving their heads? I shave my head. It is glorious. So it's all circumstantial. <laughs> this is all part of just, it was part of these traditions. It's part of a religious vow. It's part of like, you know, we're taking a vow. They had baptisms that were the same, same way. It was like a baptism of purification where it's like you're setting yourself aside for the Lord. You're saying this is a special time of seeking God or fasting or a special time of dedicating my life to God. It was that kind of a thing. But it was in the tradition of the culture, of the Jewish culture, of the Jewish religion, which was that, you know, you're going to shave your head, and then you're going to, like, fast and be really close to God. And then after a certain period of time, you know, you come to the temple and be cleansed. And it's like a spiritual cleansing. Can you point me to a scripture where it talks about this somewhere in the Old Testament? Shaving the head to... Anybody, you Bible scholars, can you point me to... Now, does God have something against people who shave their heads? No. Does the Holy Spirit ever want us to seek him in special ways? To take a week, a month, a season, and seek the Lord in a special way? Of course, the Lord would love such a thing, wouldn't he? But we're dealing with something else here, aren't we? We're dealing with doing this to be approved by this group, this group of Christians in this case who happen to be Jewish Christians. How do you think it's going to turn out? There's a truth. I didn't write it for you, but you can write it yourself. When you give in to get along, when you give in to get along, and when you go along to get in, you're wasting your time. When you give in to get along, this is what Paul's doing right here. This is my interpretation of this scripture. When you go along to get in, to be accepted, you are wasting your time. In our day, we have a term for this called virtue signaling. And virtue signaling is where you do something so people can see you do it so that they will look at you in a positive way, right? It's common for human beings. We do it 
unconsciously many times. But in our, in our world, it's like, it's like the Hollywood star or the politician who's calling for a reduction in carbon emissions, and we need to be careful to take care of the planet. But they have like four mansions and a private jet, and they use like 10,000 times the average person's carbon emission in their lifestyle. You, you know what I'm saying? That's what we're talking about. That's virtue signaling. And, but, you, but you can send a, send a Snapchat or a tweet about, you know, taking care of the environment. And you're using 10,000 times the average person's, you know, amount of resources. Or the politician who calls for no police. Uh, but they got about 20 police serving as their own personal bodyguards. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, whatever. <laughs> whatever. Or the person who talks about being inclusive. About what they're really looking for is a photo opportunity. So they look good. That's virtue signaling. You're trying to be approved by people. You're trying to do something that looks good in front of people. Right? We do it all the time. But it happens in the church too. Did you know that? It happens in religion as well. The same way. So in religion, I've seen so many different ways that it happens. But, and it's just kind of natural. Because when we're, when, we're part, when we're saved, or really when we're part of any organization, part of what the human mind is trying to do is determine who's in and who's out. Who's doing right and who's not doing right. Who's okay and who's not okay. So in the Christian world, now for him the virtue signaling was, you need to show that you're submissive to the law as they define the law in this little passage. But in the church many times it looks like this. If you're a real Christian, you'll be able to name like 15 or 20 popular other Christian speakers and call them heretics. So you say, oh, that person's a heretic. We don't do that much. I don't throw that word around because I actually, I, have more, I just have a historical understanding of what that term means. And most people who are in the Christian world are not heretics. Most of them believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to be saved and a number of other things that make them not heretics. But that doesn't mean everybody's doctrine is perfect. That doesn't mean everyone, that doesn't mean there aren't charlatans, okay? A charlatan and a heretic are two different things. Can't get in that today. So, you know, that's, I've been in some circles though where you, you have to reject certain people or you're not accepted. See, in some circles that's like uh, any woman preacher, you know, Joyce Myers or something or anybody, or even, um, oh, what's the other one? Uh, Beth Moore, sure, Beth Moore. Some, 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 some religious circles, if you like anybody along those lines, just a second. There you go. Then, then you're either really immature and you have no knowledge of Christianity or you're a heretic. <laughs> okay? But you might go to another religious group in our day and they'll have a whole other set of standards. It's if you don't use the right language. Brother. <laughs> Listen, brother. Yes, sister. If you don't talk brother and sister-ish, sister-ease, then you're not a very mature Christian, and you probably, you know, need to get sanctified a little bit more brother. <laughs> okay? Now, so it goes on and on and on. And I hope when you, this message is done today that what has happened in your heart has not been uh, bitterness or resentment toward people of, who are in these spots or us when we act this way. Because all of us do this at times. And I hope it is not arrogance to think that, well, I'm now above all this. I'm not by the law. I'm something better. And these poor suckers out here, they're trying to follow Jesus, following all these rules. They just don't know what they're doing. Okay, I see that all the time too. Yeah. That is not Christ, right? That's not the spirit of Christ. What's, what's, what's the north point on our compass? What is it? It's life in the spirit. It's pleasing Jesus. The way we know whether we're stuck here or not is when we do something, is does the pleasure of God flow into our lives or not? When I complain about people, it doesn't bring God's pleasure and presence into my life. This is one of the ways I know that complaining actually isn't what the Holy Spirit is leading me to do. Amen. There are plenty of scriptures to back that up. So, so this, is our, this is our compass. This is why you can't follow God by any set of rules, no matter how good they are. You can't do it. You will mess it up. Any group of people will mess it up, no matter how perfect the rules are. 
You can have all the creeds written out, and, and you, can, you can say, all we're going to do is follow the Christian creeds. That's all we're going to do. That's all we believe. And you might end up the most messed up cult that ever walked the face of the earth. Because without the Holy Spirit being the magnetic north of our life, we are incapable of following God, of knowing God, of doing anything good. It will be terrible. So as followers of Jesus seeking a life in the Spirit, we want to be wise so that when we see the fruit, we take it and eat it, the good stuff, and when we see the rot, we recognize it for what it is. And we say, no, I'm not going to jump right in there. It's like this. This is why I brought this shield today. Now, the Bible talks about having a shield, sword, all kinds of different armor. This one's made of plastic. It's a little bit firm plastic. And when you're playing Nerf or, you know, several other games, even paintball it might work, this is a handy thing to have around. But if you're ever in a real fight, like with bullets, <laughs> or something like that, a real war, you know, this is probably actually just a hindrance. Unless the enemy is throwing rocks at you only or something. All this is going to do if someone's shooting at me is give me a false sense of security, right? This is what religion that is not pure, this is what rules and regulations that are not actually me following the true magnetic north of the Holy Spirit. This is what they do in my life. This is what they are. They make me feel like I've got some protection. They make me feel like I'm doing something good, brother. You know, they make me feel like this. They make me feel like I'm part of the church because I say words like sanctified. And, you know, whatever it is, they make me feel like this, but they're of no value. They don't do anything. All they do is take up one of my hands that could be used for something else. In fact, they actually hurt me they hurt me because instead of actually okay, being ready to go, I'm depending on something that is of no value to God whatsoever. Of no value to God. I'm thinking my life is okay because I do and don't and am accepted by this group. And, and the truth is all of that is just a distraction from the one thing that must be present with my life in the Spirit. And that is pleasing God with my life listening to the spirit and saying yes sowing into the spirit instead of the flesh amen paul unfortunately my interpretation of this passage is paul is about to get trapped into the trap of religion here but god is faithful god sends a whole angry crowd ready to kill him to snap him right out of it <laughs> let's take a look then everyone will know there's no truth in these reports about you, verse 24, but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. As for the Gentile believers, we've written to them our decision that they should abstain from food, sacrifice to idols, from blood, from meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You can read about that in another spot. So what are they doing? They're saying, Paul, man, the, the, the life of God that's in you, that's just wonderful, Paul patting him on the head. Paul, that's just wonderful. God's moving and you're so excited about Jesus. Paul, that's just wonderful. Whoa, you're such a little cute. You always pitch those jeans. But Paul, you need to come and understand what it's really like to live here as one, of, as one of us who are really following the law, who are really pleasing God. Yeah, they're the Gentiles. We gave them four rules to follow. That's enough. But we know the important stuff, Paul. We know what it's like to really follow God. I just, I just can't move on. Sorry, I, I got to stop. I got to pause right here. So in, in our world today, this is what this looks like. No, brother, you don't have to follow these rules to be saved, but if you're wise or mature or really want to please God, you're going to do these things. And I've come to the point where if I just don't see it plainly listed here, or when I'm speaking to, the Holy, to God and listening to the Holy Spirit, if he isn't speaking it directly to my heart, which might just be for me, not for other people, if this isn't happening, I am not going to judge anyone around me as having missed God for not doing my religious things. 
Because there's a lot of stuff in here God actually said and wants us to do. There's plenty to fill my life with. There's plenty of shoulds. Why should I add anything else? Somebody say amen. So I'm not going to do it. As for the Gentile believers, we have written to them, verse 26. The next day Paul took the men and purified himself along with them. And by the way, going back here, he says, but you yourself, they'll see you yourself are living in obedience to the law. Was Paul actually living in obedience to the law? Was Paul actually living in obedience to the law, the way they're defining it? No, no, he wasn't living that way. He didn't live that way at all. He was out with the Gentiles. They were eating pork. Yeah, you know, they were dousing whatever they were drinking. He wasn't getting drunk probably, but he was with them in their culture, doing their thing. He was living in their houses, you know. Some of them had a pig living in the front room, you know, in their little farm hut. He'd go in there and camp out with them. He was not living by the law. Not what they're talking about, the law. He was not living by that law. But, man, it's so hard when the pressure comes on. It's so hard when the community, or what you think is the community, is, is bringing the conformity. It's so hard. Because it's in our human nature to say, well, yeah, I'm a, I'm a good Christian. Or, or yeah, yeah, I'm a good citizen. Or you, whatever it is. It's so hard to think for yourself and say, well, no, that isn't real. No, it's, it's so hard. It's so much more natural to say, oh, yeah, yeah, James. Yeah, 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 elders. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a good Christian. I'm living according to the law. Yeah, sure. After all, look at these thousands of Jews that are all agree. Okay, I got to move on. Then he went to the temple. He gave his notice, for the days of purification would end, and the offering would be made for each of them. And they were making offerings to the temple. I go so far to say that this was anti-Christ to participate in temple worship after Jesus Christ has come and been the only sacrifice. I'm not going to say that for certain because that's not, it just, it just gives the narrative here. It doesn't give God's opinion about it. It's just the narrative. But man, I don't see how you could go participate in temple worship after the temple was no longer of any meaning, for we are now the temple of Christ. Man, do you see how far this took Paul down? I mean, this is Paul who was... I didn't have it on your sheet, but I want to read you something from Galatians chapter 2. If you have a Bible, you can turn there. Now, Galatians happens before this, historically, time frame-wise. So, this is happening before Acts chapter 21. Galatians 2.11, when Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. In other words, he was obviously wrong. For before certain men came from James, this is the same James reading about in Acts 21, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. That's this group. That's Acts 21. That's this group. That's these thousands of Jews zealous for the law. Okay? Verse 13. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. Verse 14, and when I saw they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, that's Peter, in front of them all, you're a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Jesus Christ that we may be justified by faith in Christ, not by works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. And he goes on, gives a great conclusion to this. But this is the same Paul who is now going up to the temple to make his offerings at the temple. And I don't know if that was money. Maybe it was just money, but whatever it was. At the temple... Moving on along. Maybe I should pause right here. <laughs> Sorry. How many of you have experienced this before in your life? The community bringing the condemnation that causes the confirmation or, the, or that causes the, you to conform 
That's what I mean by conformation. How many of you experienced that in your life? You can think of times. Sure. God, we love, we want to love people well, Lord. We love the people around us. But Lord, we just shake off in your name any voices that would cause us to do things which are not honorable to you, God. Even from family, even from culture, even from, from groups, even from, even, from the, even from religious groups or the church. God, if something is not pleasing to you, God, we just, we just shake that off. We reject that fear in Jesus' name. We reject that need to be accepted by someone more than we want to be accepted by you, Holy Spirit. God, well, well, that is not us. We reject that in the name of Jesus Christ, that we can live life in the Spirit. Amen. When we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers, oh, I'm sorry, next page. When the seven days were nearly over, verse 27. Some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, Fellow Israelites, help us. This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law and this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple to defile this holy place. They had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian in the city with Paul and assumed Paul had brought him into the temple. He hadn't actually done that, though. And the whole city was aroused. And the people came running from all directions, seizing Paul. They dragged him from the temple, and immediately the gates were shut. And while they were trying to kill him, why don't you underline that right there? While they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. And when the rioters saw the commander and the soldier, they stopped beating Paul. They seem like nice people. <laughs> so, now, here's the, here's the amazing thing to remember. If you've been suckered by religion, okay, God is still in control. God is still in control. Even when religious ideas or religious people or a church or, or some situation brings real pain in your life, God is still in control. God is still doing something in your life. God is still able to do something great. And remember, we don't see Paul lashing out in bitterness toward the church there that got him into this situation. We don't see him like starting a feud with James and the boys and saying, what did you get me into? We don't see any of that because that's not the spirit of Christ. Amen. So that's not what we're supposed to learn when we go through something like this. But we do want to learn, amen? We do want to learn that there's a difference between the life of the Spirit and the letters of the law, whoever's writing them. There's a big difference. And I am going to live by the Spirit. I'm going to live by the leadership and the freedom and the love of the Spirit. Amen. So he goes in there. He's trying to... And this is the irony of this. It's so ironic. He's trying to be accepted by these Jewish people. These many thousands who are zealous for the law, as the leaders have told him. He's trying to be accepted by them for his ministry because it's the church. They're Christians. You know, he's trying to be accepted by them. And the result is he almost ends up getting killed by people of that same religious strain. Not the Christian ones, but the rest of the Jews. I find God's sense of humor hilarious. I wonder what Paul was thinking as they were beating him to a pulp there, as he was on the ground getting flailed around. And the Roman, secular, don't care about God government had to come save his butt. The irony is thick. I love it. Okay. So Rome saves him. Praise God. And I'm just wondering during this time, where are these many thousands of the zealous ones. Where are they at? Do you see them defending Paul? Not even just a hundred of them? I mean, there are thousands, right? Do you see them defending Paul? Do you see them, like, show up and try to talk to the Romans on Paul's behalf after Paul's arrested and they're trying to figure out what's going on? Do you see them anywhere in here? They're like little dirty cockroaches scattering into the corners, 
when trouble comes. Here's another lesson I've learned about religion. When the heat is on, if people are doing things just because it's part of their tradition, there is no courage left in the spine. They're gone. They're not going to stand with you. Now, it doesn't mean there weren't good Christians in the church there. I'm sure there were. It doesn't mean people weren't hoping Paul got out or praying for Paul. I'm sure there were. But you've got to understand there is no power in your trying to conform for the sake of conformity to the people, to the organizations, to the groups, even the religious groups around you. There is no power in that because the same kind of organizations and groups that will try to make you do something just so you look good, so, so you're not offensive to someone. Hey, you, you, better, you better tone that down, Dallas. Hey, hey you better, you better uh, talk a little differently than that. Pooh, you better, you better get your act together. You, you know, this is a tradition here. You know, when we come together, you need to wear uh, a suit and a tie. That's important in this kind of a setting because you blah, 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 blah. You know, you know, on and on and on and on. These same people, when you're in trouble, are going to scatter like cockroaches. You didn't know that. It kind of gives you some inner strength to know, go, no, God, I'm just going to stand with you. I'm just going to love like Jesus. I'm just going to do what's right. These are real people. This doesn't mean these are bad people. It doesn't mean I hate them. It doesn't mean I dislike in any way. But organized religion is not going to save my soul. Organizations who have a lot to lose if all of a sudden somebody tweets badly about me are not going to lose it all just to be with me when I'm in trouble. Somebody say amen. amen. It's good to have real friends though, right? Yes. It's good to have people who really love Jesus and will stand with you amen. and not just care about what people think. Somebody say amen. 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 So they were who knows what, but probably trying to protect themselves. After all, you know, we don't want the church to get a bad name, right? Can't get, rup can't get wrapped up in bad press. I just want to puke. Somebody come help me. All right. Truth. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Let's say it together. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Let's say it again. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. I remember an example of when I was in college, there were revival meetings that were happening once a week, like renewal revival meetings at a church, pretty large church in the town we were in. And they would bring in usually like a speaker, like an evangelist type speaker, and there'd be like a big worship night, people praying, receiving prayer. It was really great. And um, one week, and the person organizing it was a it was pastor of that church, I think he, great heart. And one week, you know, they bring in different worship groups. And one week they brought in a worship group that was more than just a little bit crazy. And they were worshiping Jesus. But they, like, it was like if you went down to, you know, the shelter and put together a worship band. You know, they wouldn't be all cool like what you see on your YouTube videos. You know, they wouldn't have everything just perfect. Instead, there was a little bit of, you know, ah, going on, you know, and they were pretty loud. And, you know, it was obvious loving Jesus, but it wasn't Chris Tomlin. You know what I'm saying? And so the next week, we were there, and I remember that the pastor was kind of hosting everything. I remember her getting, getting up and giving a several-minute apology to everyone for the worship team being let in the week before and I was young back then and I was just noting and I was thinking man these people were real Christians they really loved Jesus it wasn't like they were I mean they weren't doing something ungodly in any way it was just you know sort of unorganized rock band instead of your Chris Tomlin or something you know and uh, but loving Jesus and uh, I was like you know if they were sitting here in this room those people who love Jesus, who came in and gave their best, I mean, how would this hit them? This, we're so sorry for letting these kind of people in. Apology. You know, and it was just a little short while, and those meetings were done and shut down. And what happened, I think, was people inside the church just, you know, 
things went crazy. It was the religion thing inside that big church. It had been established a while. All of a sudden, there was fighting going on, this, that, and the other. And then that pastor was actually gone. And I don't know the details. I, you know, I wasn't privy to all the details. I, I can imagine. Don't know for sure. But that was the case. What's going on there? Man, there is no substitute for life in the Spirit, for putting the Holy Spirit number one, for putting God, what pleases God number one. And every time I let that religion come in and I change the pure following of Jesus and His commands and the pure loving of people, every time I change that for the sake of this other thing, I become weaker. And God is grieved. God is grieved. I remember another time. These were formative years of this. I'm still having formative years. There was a, 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 a guy coming to town to have meetings. And he was, he was, he was well known at the time. And uh, the Holy Spirit really moved in his meetings. And of course, he was controversial because anybody like that is always going to be controversial because one reason or another, they're going to be controversial. So he was controversial and I was going, I was going to a, you know, a, 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 a seminary that was open to the gifts of the Spirit. You know, it wasn't like the chosen frozen only could go there or something like that. And so I'm going to the seminary and I, I sit down and there's, there's a, per, there's, we have chapel meetings, we have different, you know, discussion boards. And so I go in and talk to the person who could basically make the call to have him in for chapel, this person who's visiting town, a very well-known person, very anointed. I said, hey, how about we have him in for a chapel meeting? Or how about we have him in for just a discussion or a panel board or something, you know? They're in town here. I bet they come, I bet they come during the day. They're evening meetings. They're here during the day. Let's have them in. And I remember sitting in his office. I remember him looking at me and thinking, and the wheels are turning. I remember him beginning to make excuses to me why we shouldn't do that. You know, why it just wouldn't be proper for the way some people would view. Because, you know, some people don't like this or that about that person's ministry. And, and some people are probably offended by their style. And, you know, this, and this person I'm talking to, this is the person who was supposed to be like leading the renewal movement at our seminary. We were having a little mini renewal movement with extra prayer meetings, all these things happening. And this is one of the, like, two or three main leaders of this renewal movement in our seminary. And so I'm sitting there listening to him, I'm like, well, yeah, I understand that, but, you know, it's not like we're all bowing down and worshiping this person. We're just having a speaker in the seminary. Wouldn't it be a good thing? I mean, we have lots of people in. You know, this isn't like, you know, you know, we're all adults here and Christians. No, 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 that would be, and I could see when I left that office, I was like, this is, He's just afraid politically of what's going to happen here. And it wasn't, I don't think it was more than a month. And he was relieved of his position at the seminary. And it turned out he, he had uh, fallen into sin, was having an affair with somebody in some other, some other town. And, you know, I, I, I'm not going to go on to more and more stories, but as these stories accumulate in my life and I speak to the Holy Spirit about them, I, I see this pattern again and again and again and again. It is the Spirit that brings life. When you allow religion to come in and begin to dictate your movements and what you're going to do and your thoughts and what you're going to accept and what you're going to say just so you can be accepted by others, God is not pleased. God does, because you've only got so, you've only got two hands. Are you going to fill one of your hands with this and one of your hands with this? And then what are you left with to do something for God with? You've been accepted by some group for some reason. And now you've got these in your hands. Man, this is what I say. No, no, forget it. Look, I love every person. I don't want to offend people on purpose. That's ridiculous. We're not in the offending business. We're not trying to stir up trouble. And we're not trying to say, we're the only chosen ones. Everybody else is just religious. That's, that's, all that is ridiculous. Paul didn't do that. But by the grace of God, we are not going to be bound by the laws of religions when we have the word of life and we have the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Somebody say amen. So... I just personally refuse to do it. 
The result is, I'm sure there are many times, you know, I'm talking about as a pastor, as somebody who goes to seminary, somebody has been, you know, done different things. I've gone to ETS, that's the Evangel Evangelical Theological Society meeting of all the greatest and brightest minds held different places uh, around the country. You know, I, you know, I'm sure there are many times people have looked at your pastor and said, eh, <laughs> I don't care. I love them. I want to bless them. I want to help them. But I'm not going to be bound by religion. It is not going to happen in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you will say the same thing for yourself? And you have to realize it can happen anywhere. It can happen right here at River Center Church. Maybe it has at different times. Because we're human beings. We have to actually do things. We have to actually do things to honor Christ. You know, we actually have songs and, you know, meet in places and in our homes. We actually do things. And when you do things, you form habits. You form ways to do it. You've got to do it some way, Right? So it's not that ways is wrong. It's that we've got to remember our hands are open right now. It's what pleases Jesus. That's what we do. All the ways can change. All, all, that, all that can change. It's, it's of secondary or even less importance. What's important is Jesus Christ, is the Holy Spirit, the leadership of God. And if I love Jesus, I'm going to obey his words. I'm going to want to do what he has said, but I'm going to do what he has said. I don't have to add to it nor take away. Amen. Amen. Now, I think I'm going to have to cut short the rest of this message. Remember, Paul didn't get bitter. I want to remind you that if you have been hurt in the church in the past, it could have been many things. Sometimes we just get offended as human beings because our pride gets hurt. But sometimes it's others really do things wrong to us. Many times this is a result of human beings trying to function inside a, a religious system or a law system of some sort or or most of the time it's a mix of God's doing things and there's this law that was what's going on in Jerusalem here God was really I'm sure there were many really saved people in that church James is a legend but there he was yet convincing Paul to do this you know in this system and so the result is we don't if we have been part of that man you have to realize these are just human beings even the ones that hurt you or the ones that are closed-minded in some way, or the ones that judge on something that's besides this, you have to realize they're just human beings, just like you and me. They need the grace of God. God loves them. Many of them don't know any better. Amen? And so if I've been hurt in these situations, I have to release that and really love these people. Because the truth is, I am just as prone to be in the wrong, to put some idea of mine up high and judge people by it. See, I'm just as prone to do that as anyone else. Amen. I just want to pray right now for you in this room. If you've been hurt and, and you recognize that maybe this is one of the factors in that, I just want to pray for you right now that you'll be able to release that in Jesus' name and like Paul, respond by keep loving the whole church. Keep loving the whole church. Jews and Gentiles, the whole thing. God, in, in your name, Anyone in this room who has been hurt by laws that have been set up, by religious traditions that have been set up, by religious ideas that have been lifted up, that, that aren't your direct leading Holy Spirit or misunderstandings or just whatever they are. God, we just release every one of those things in Jesus' name. We release every one of those people in Jesus' name. God, that you would bless them, that you bless us. God, that we'd be able to, to just be an example of a, of, a, of, a, of a person who loves you, who has life in the Spirit, who demonstrates like you did, Jesus, what it means to know the Father and to love well, but to have all of our security bound up in you.